This is Alexander Sakharov from University of Canada West, and you're listening to SME Stories Podcast. You are now listening to the next great small business podcast. Welcome to the SME Stories Podcast, where it is all about small businesses in Canada. And here's your host, Ken Alfred. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having on the show. we got a great episode today with assistant professor from University of Canada West, Alexander Sakharov. Alexander holds an MBA from Holt International Business School in Boston, Massachusetts. We also served as a vice president of Holt European Business Club and coordinator of the third Holt VC and Entrepreneurship Summit in 2013. He also holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Nizhny Novgorod State University in Russia. Professionally, Alexander has over 16 years of hands-on experience with for-profit and not-for-profit organizations spanning numerous industries, including high-tech, banking, insurance, and retail. Alexander is a co-founder and managing partner for Grizzly Power, a household exterior cleaning and maintenance company in Vancouver, British Columbia. I think what's a really cool story that you're going to hear is how he actually started his career working at a furniture shop in just one location and being able to expand it to 90 locations. So I think it's going to be a great story. So Alexander was a great guest. So sit back and absorb. So, all right. So another question that we have here is for team motivation. So what have you found to be your biggest secrets that help train and motivate your team to, to really excel? Oh, well, I would say... Tip number one, um, hiring those people who share your own, um, I would say your own expectations about the company, uh, hire like-minded people. That's very important. And in, in my life, I've seen many, uh, manager, many managers, many, uh, company owners who, who are talented in this, they hire amazing people, uh, like-minded people. So I would say step number one is. When you hire people, this is actually step zero of motivation. So this is where you start motivating people because you hire like-minded people and it helps to motivate other people in your team. Uh, number two, uh, be optimistic. <clears throat> Even if um, there is something going on in the company that uh, might lead to um, some failures in the future and you might expect them, still be optimistic. Be transparent, but be optimistic. Uh, celebrate little wins. This is very important because uh, big wins, yes, obviously everybody celebrates big wins. Like we, we hit $1 billion sales this year. Let's celebrate it. Yeah, but how often big wins happen? Maybe once a year, maybe once in a couple of years. So uh, it's very important to celebrate little wins just to demonstrate to the team, to yourself, that you're in the right way. And that's that, I believe, is a good motivation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. I mean, I remember when I used to, my previous company before, I actually was a team leader where I was in charge of about six to sometimes 10 associates. And it was for a fitness certification company. And one of the ways I would always try to bring the, the team together to motivate them was what I call Timbit Fridays. Now, for those of you who don't know what Timbits are, mm -hmm. uh, I've, obviously, you know, Alex also being from Canada here, we all know what Tim Hortons is and one of their biggest sellers aside from donuts. And coffee is Timbits, which is basically a round little uh, piece of deliciousness. That's what I like to call. And uh, what I would do every pay period, I would buy like a 40 pack of Timbits and just leave them on my desk. So, and I, where my desk was possession, sorry, where my desk was positioned is that when the people would, when the staff would enter in, they'd have to pass my desk to get to their desks. So they, I would always have this out. And people would all, and I, you know, have it open and they're fresh Timbits. So they're nice and warm and they're moist and all the different flavors. Everyone was happy. Right. And of course, me being a dick, I decided to also put the nutritional information pamphlet right next to the Timbits. So just so that I'm, I was kind of serious about that. Some people were not liking that, but you know, I think they were happy with the Timbits in general because they did not want to take a look at the caloric density of a Timbit. But anyways, when I left that company, do you know what the first question was, Alex, when I left the company? What? They said, as soon as I was, you know, I made this nice emotional speech, you know, it's been, it was a great time at this company. I had to move on. And the first person said, what about Timbit Friday? I'm yeah. like, really? That was the, I, I was an awesome team leader to you. And that's the first question you're going to ask me is what, what about Timbit Friday? My boss at the time, she was saying, maybe we can do some kind of, you know, maybe like a vegetable, fresh vegetable Friday. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to go well. <laughs> and people like, not gonna we go want well. Timbit Friday. We, we don't want, want Timbit Friday or something. Don't give them fresh vegetables. 
you know, maybe make that a Monday when everyone's already in a bad mood because they have to come back from the weekend. Vegetable Monday, pick up some fresh vegetables. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. But uh, no, that's pretty cool there. So, okay, so now next question here because you've watched, you've you've a lot of your students have a lot of ideas. So aside from raising capital, which I mean, I'm going to ask you as well, has there ever what is the most unique business idea that you have heard from your students? Well, I would say that. I'm not sure that I can share all the ideas because no, some, no, no, no. Just, just the most unique one that stands out to you. That's like I, hmm. I would say that um, there are many. Honestly, there are many unique ideas. There are many unique ideas, and uh, sometimes I'm, I'm when when students, for example, do the presentation uh, in entrepreneurship class. I'm sitting in the classroom and I basically switch the places with them. They're presenting. I'm sitting in the class, and sometimes I think like. The idea is so great that you definitely need to need to go forward, need to go to the next step. Uh, the problem that I see in these really unique ideas is that uh, maybe bringing the unique ideas one step, which is like, again, not the easiest step, but it's the first step. The next step is to think how to implement it. So I would say many of the unique ideas that I, I've heard, that I, again, I, I've heard many unique ideas. I can't come up with just one idea. I've heard ideas similar to yours, by the way, like not the reminders, but like some schedulers, which mm. uh, uh, helps to um, help to avoid the conflicts in the schedule, especially when you have multiple calendars. For example, you have Outlook, you have Gmail. Gmail, have, yeah. Uh, yeah. Calendly or something yeah, like that, yes. Exactly. So like uh, tools, apps that helps to avoid these conflicts and can help to like all those schedulers, uh, all those scale tools to cooperate between each other. Uh, but again, the next step is to know how to implement it. And this is, uh, we have another course, for example, in, in university that actually like it's a next level of the entrepreneurship course when uh, students can literally work on one idea and literally start actually working on it in, in the real life. So it's not just the idea for the course, it's, it's actually the idea for the real startup. Really? So then literally, people taking your class, they can literally create, they can literally start their business throughout the entire portion of the class. Well, which yeah. Is, and, and which is great because then you're not rushing into anything. Mm -hmm. you're, you're getting that consistent feedback from a professional like Alex here to say, okay, good, you got this part. What about this? What about this? What about well, this? So they don't rush into the same thing where they could have spent hundreds upon thousands of dollars compiling this idea and then they got either no way to implement it or implementation is going to be super messy or there's extra costs that they're going to be having to pay. So that's a really cool thing. So you should see the ideas that students come up with uh, in the prototyping class because this is where they need actually to create a, a prototype of the product, like a low fidelity prototype and uh, they use different tools that actually like show you the product you can't like it it, it, it is not functioning uh for the reason right but because it's a prototype but they they show you they walk you through the product and again this is another uh time when i look at the projects uh, presented by students and think like well that could be for example the next netflix or it the could next be wow next, like, facebook yeah sometimes the ideas are really like great and uh, in this case, what I do, I tell students like, uh, don't you think to actually continue working on it? And some students do have it in their mind. They actually, some students are super active. They're super engaged. Uh, usually if we speak about the team, for example, there's, uh, there are, there's one or two students who are more motivated with the ideas. Probably those students came up with this idea and they are those who actually would like to continue. But for those who are, um, uh, for example, doing the, uh, coming up with the idea just for the course, I say like, you need to think again, one step ahead. The idea mm -hmm. is brilliant. You need to do something with that. And this is when I send them to this, uh, uh, another course that actually helps students to dive into the, uh, deeper into the operational steps of the idea implementation. Yeah. Because I think what people sometimes forget too, is that I think, a lot of business owners, they think, okay, I'm going to create this product or service. And even if they're replicating a product or service, it, it's just going to be running their job pretty much. <laughs> Where maybe one idea is to create products that your goal is to try to sell it off, mm -hmm. you know, make it 
so popular that you'll just sell it off and let them let someone else run with it and you're just collecting residuals on it or you're just selling off the idea and then you're just going to take all that big money that you came in to now you can either relax or create another product mm -hmm. where your goal is to not do the day-to-day -day, is to sell the idea of whatever this product or service is and outsource it out altogether which is another i'm sure some students have come up with that idea where you know because i think the idea of creation of something it's it's a lot of work right mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. to try to maybe some people might get scared off of like okay, I created this concept, I'm implementing it, but how do I get out of it in terms of saying, okay, it's great, but I mean, I don't want the, I don't want to be working 80 hours a week on a daily basis or on a weekly basis uh, for this product because, you know, I'm making, I'm making money, but I can't really, I have no time. So that's something that you got to figure out as well then. So I guess the next step, the next question I have for you is that what is the biggest I guess in your students, you've, you've seen your students, what is the biggest time waster that you've noticed with your students? Where if they focus maybe either too much or not enough time on something? I would say that um, the very first step in many entrepreneurship related classes to come up with the idea. Uh, and usually I would say this is where I would like students to spend a little bit more time on. Because again, coming up with the idea, some students already have several ideas in their mind when they join entrepreneurship class. Some students start brainstorming once they join entrepreneurship class. But uh, many students come up with the ideas, once again, great ideas, but with some little gaps in the implementation plan. So for example, this idea is great, but right now it's bad timing. Right now, for example, the technologists are not that good enough to implement this idea. Maybe this idea would be great like in five years. Or um, there might be a great idea, but if you do a little bit deeper research, you realize that there are some small but still competitors or some other startups that are already working on it. And maybe there is a, even like a patent or intellectual property pending right now. So definitely, again, the idea might be great, but um, it might be not that viable because... Uh, there are so many challenges right now that prevent you from implementing it. Uh, or anyway, you might like fight against these challenges, but still it needs a little bit more research. So maybe I would say uh, it's better for students to spend, maybe not inside the course, because course is just like several weeks, like 12 weeks length, right? So uh, just a couple of weeks might not be enough and we, we can't spend like all 12 weeks just thinking about the idea, but um, in general, in the future, I always tell students, like, spend a little bit more time on ideas, brainstorm, use, uh, for example, there is an, uh, an approach called six hats approach by Di Bono, when you have to wear different hats, mm -hmm. think about the idea from the perspective of like optimistic perspective, why this idea will work. And then you wear a different hat, virtual hat, and think about like why this idea will not work or wear oh. another hat or like some data that can support your idea. And then wear another hat and think about gut, gut, gut feeling that might like why this idea will work. Just, just give me, give me your gut feeling. So uh, I recommend students to go through all these steps. We do some uh, six hat uh, exercises sometimes during the uh, team work as well. But generally speaking, this is probably what I would like students to spend a little bit more time on. Well, I think what also what's, what's really good about that concept is that it really forces them to question themselves, right? Because the, the challenge that most people will have is that one, they're either going to find people who are, you know, because who are you going to tell your ideas to generally? Family and friends, the people you love the most. And either you're going to get one of two things. One, you're either going to get the dream killer that mm -hmm. says that'll never work. Yeah. Or two who just love you and say, oh yeah, that, that, that's an awesome idea, but have no idea exactly how your thing is actually going to be a good idea. Like they mm -hmm. don't want to hurt your feelings, mm -hmm. right? So you got to find that middle ground, the six hats there where you're saying, here's why my idea will work. Here's why my idea won't work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to give, the, give you that really make you think as well. And then of course, contracting with, you know, pot, you know with potential uh, prospects or like you said, talking to family yeah. friends here, I'm looking at this concept Here's why I think it might work. Here's why I think it'll work. Am I missing anything? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a really good thing here. So last question on Sister the Pro segment here is, okay, what is one of the, what is your tip 
for raising capital that mm. people can do without having to take a full course from you. I know there's more details to it, but generally what is the, I wouldn't say maybe a couple of quick tips that if someone's yeah. looking to raise capital, what they can implement. For sure. Well, tip number one, I would say network. Network, network, network. This is something that uh, uh, you can use as step zero without even starting raising the capital, start increasing your network. Uh, because you never know when and where you're going to, you know, face the investor. You're going to meet the investor. So mm -hmm. your network will definitely, if you, if you grow your network, it will grow your chances to get the investments later on. Uh, the tip number two that I would give is to, again, be one step ahead, learn about the potential investors you might meet somewhere. For example, if you go to a certain event and you're going to pitch your idea and you know that there's going to be five people listening to your idea and you know their names, do your research, learn a little bit about those investors because there might be very, uh, I would say narrow focus investors who only invest in a certain field, in a certain industry. Uh, and if you're going to pitch to these investors and focus on these investors and then approach these investors after the pitch and like speak to, to this investor, you might just waste your time because this investor simply does not invest in, in your field or in your industry. And it's going to look like you didn't really make a research before. So you might, uh, you might you know, get into this confusing situation when the investor listens to you and then says like, oh, you know what, um, I actually don't invest in this field. You should have done your little research before. Well, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is uh, probably the second tip. And tip number three, uh, and uh, that's going to be my last tip uh, <laughs> because uh, I know that there might be 10 other tips, but I'm going to stop here. And tip number three is don't be too like, pushy during the pitch. Don't try to sell your idea with like, I don't know, with uh, any cost. Don't try to approach the investor when the investor is eating or drinking and you're like hiding. Or spending time with their family. Yeah. You're trying to, yeah, I think that's some great advice that you just gave there, Alex, mm -hmm. because knowing, you see, before we always just talk about knowing who your clients are, mm -hmm. who's your ideal client, but also for this, you know who your investors are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're going to be approaching, let's say a surgeon or an attorney, to fund your business idea versus your uncle Joe. Yeah. That just, you know, is, is there that you're just looking for a little bit of startup money just to build a little mini prototype versus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going to, let's say a doctor or a surgeon, because for a certain and attorneys, those ones that generally make a lot more money, mm -hmm. they just don't have time to try to make their money grow. So mm -hmm. to them, it's like, they want to find something that's safe, low risk, all that sort of stuff. So you have to be very more detail oriented with, yeah the higher value investor versus if you really just are trying to go amongst your family and friends and just getting a, oh, maybe a little $1,000 here, $500 there, little nitpicky stuff here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to approach it differently. You can't, you know, oh yeah, my prototype is going to cost, you know, $100,000. So how mm -hmm. much, how much Uncle Joe can you help me out in this? I'll give you, you know, 2% return on your money or something like that, right? Yeah, you got to yeah. be very careful with that. And if I can add one one more little point here, I would say the first investor is extremely important because um, many investors, they go for so-called self-commitment when they say like, we will invest if, if only you bring one more investor who we know, for example, who, mm -hmm. who is quite like famous. So I would recommend try to uh, focus on the investor who will later on with help of their own network or with help of their name will help you to bring even more investors. Exactly. All right. So perfect. Now it's time for the rapid fire round. All right. Let's do, let's do some fun stuff here. This is the rapid fire round now where we have some really quick questions and we will hopefully see Alex give us the answer to that. You ready? Sure. All right. Question number one, what would the 15 year old self imagine you'd be doing right now? Uh, that's a good question. When I was a child, I wanted to become a doctor, uh, which I've never be become, but that was <laughs> my dream when I was like 10 years old, or maybe like 12 years old. When I was 15 years old, I think at that time I was uh, moving from the doctor field to the banking field and I wanted to work in banks. I wanted to become a banker, which actually this dream came true. Uh, when I graduated from my bachelor degree, I actually started working in, in banking. It was my first 
uh, uh, first job. Uh, but yeah, when I was a child, I wanted to become a doctor. A banker. Maybe, maybe I should have, but well, I will never know. I used to want to be a doctor too at 15 because at that, at that time, one of the most popular shows was ER. Ah, so yeah, the yeah. emergency room thing. I thought, oh, that'd be cool. Uh, I had no science background or I was, nor was I good at it. So probably yeah, I'm glad yeah, I didn't yeah. do that. And even still, I wanted to be, then I thought, okay, I'll be a psychiatrist because then, uh -huh. I, you know, I used to watch the show Frasier uh -huh. back in the, back in the nineties. And then my mother, who was a nurse, she's like, um, you know, you have to go to medical school for that too, right? Yeah. Ah, never mind. Forget that. So, all right. Question number two, what is something you hate, but you wish you loved? Hmm. Well, I would say maybe, um, maybe I don't, I, I wouldn't say I hate, but I don't. Oh, no, go hate, go hate. <laughs> <laughs> go hate. Uh, well, let's, let's put it in this way. I hate to go to gym, but mm -hmm. I wish I would love to go to gym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You wish you loved it, but you hate it. I, I'm the same with durian fruit. My, uh, my, my wife and my kids, they love it. Have you ever had durian before? Mm, nope. It's one of those fruits they say uh, tastes like heaven, smells like hell. Yeah, yeah. Now um, I know what you mean. Yes, yes. I it, cannot eat that thing. Smell, yeah. It's a very strong smell. It does not mm. smell good, but apparently it tastes good. I tried it. It still didn't work. I, I wish I loved it. No, yeah, you're not. You know, speaking from a guy who hates it, yeah, you're not missing much there, Alex. So, <laughs> all right. Next question here: Who would you like to sit with on a 15-hour flight? So, who would you like to sit on a 15-hour flight with? That's a great question. So, I would probably, um, I would be quite, I would say, I would, I would have quite a regular uh, wish to sit with some, some founder. For sure, uh, uh, maybe I don't have the name. Well, if it was the name, I probably would go with uh, Elon Musk, of course. Yep. Who doesn't want to sit with Elon Musk? But I would say that uh, it could be any founder because Elon Musk is, is he, he is not just a founder right now. He's actually a huge influencer. Uh, hmm. but I would say um, I would like to sit with a founder who, who have started their business a while ago and they are quite successful right now and they are successful at the level that they are satisfied where they are but still have room for their own company's improvement. So um, I would probably choose to sit next to them because I'm pretty sure it's hard to sit next to Elon Musk because they probably fly their private jets. Yes, so should be even, a even a better reason there, Alex. I wouldn't mind sitting next to Elon Musk, whether whether you agree with him politically or all the things that, and when, this is not a political show, mm -hmm. even if you don't agree with him on certain things, mm -hmm. but just to really absorb how he does it. Yeah, yeah. How do you create all these different companies? Mm -hmm. You know, forget Twitter, because I mean, I, I, he's not, he's taking a loss on that. I'm sure it'll make money in the future, but mm -hmm. you know, most for the other businesses, how can you not figure out, mm -hmm. well, how did you come up with this? Mm -hmm. I think for me, there's two people I would love to sit on a 15 hour flight with. One would be my late father, uh -huh. Just to ask him for parenting advice and why he didn't throw me out the window when I was younger, when I was being a stupid kid. The second person I wouldn't mind talking to on a future flight, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Oh. Right? If you think about from a professional wrestler with only $7 in his pocket from what he started, who got cut by the CFL, mind you, okay. to build a multi, he's probably a multi, hundreds of millionaire kind of guy, network. Mm -hmm. You know, he would do TV shows, movies. And he still grinds in the gym. He's, he mm -hmm. loves the gym. Mm -hmm. And now he's back in the WWE as well. He's on the board of directors now. So he's now running that. Plus, he has his own tequila brand, his own skincare line. So he's, I would like to know, you know, because I'm a simple person, Alex. I'm the guy that if ever I was to make, let's say, a million or two, whatever that number is, mm -hmm. I'm the one that'd be like, all right, I'm going to take that. I'm good. I'm retired. You know, I just spend time with my family and my kids and whenever I have grandkids, I'd be content. Mm -hmm. But I want to see what, what drives someone if it's not financial. Uh-huh. Because with the with Dwayne The Rock Judge, it's not financial. With yeah. Elon Musk, it's not financial. So what is it that drive that you you still want to work crazy hours to really mm -hmm. grow? So that that's going to be one of them. All right, last two questions we have here. All right, I asked this to all my guests. What is on your sandwich and what would you call it? Okay, so I was, uh, I've heard this question in some you, other You're podcasts. prepping it. I, I was this... afraid of this question because I'm not good in cooking. But <laughs> It's a sandwich, man. There's no cooking involved. So definitely I would put there 
avocado because this is something that I really like. Okay. Tomatoes, lettuce, maybe chicken. And let, let me be a little bit, a little bit different and put some mango as well on top. I'm not going to put durian <laughs> in there. <but laughs> no mango, durian. It's a mango maybe. Let, let's make it a little bit sweet. Oh, and what would you call it? Mango cado. Mango cado. Ah, put it on a shirt. I love it. <laughs> All right. Last question we have here on the rapid fire right now. What is your theme song and why? So that song that motivates you that when people see you walking down the sidewalk, they know Alex is coming. Mm, okay. That's interesting. Uh, you know, I just, I've just purchased the tickets for Hans Zimmer, who's going to come to Vancouver in October. And I'm a big fan of this composer. And I would say there is a movie called Gladiator. Yes. And he Russell has, Crow. yeah, Russell Crowe. And he has, um, uh, he wrote this song. I, unfortunately, I forgot the name of this song, but it's one of the most popular songs from this movie. So I would probably go with this song because, um, there are no words there, but the music, it definitely, uh, it definitely makes you feel again, motivated and makes you rethink some things that might, you know, stuck in your mind uh, in a negative way and you need to rethink them again and again before they leave your mind like with, with a positive impact. So I would say uh, a song from, from this movie, from Gladiator Ooh. by Hans Zimmer. When in doubt, guys, look up the Gladiator soundtrack and then I'm sure we can find it. So, yeah. all right. So any other final advice that you would give to any aspiring entrepreneurs or people currently running their business where they're kind of stuck? What would your final advice be? I would give to in one. First of all, uh, go for it, try it. If you have something in your mind, it's better to try and regret rather than not to try and regret because you will never know. Uh, and second piece of advice is uh, be one step ahead. As I mentioned many times today, do not hesitate to do research, to learn, to learn from competitors. This is something that actually many people are afraid of doing, thinking that competitors, competitors are always evil, which is yeah. only <laughs> not. They actually companies, people who you should learn from rather than afraid of. So yeah, those are two pieces of advice. And where can people find and reach out to you? Well, uh, people obviously can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Alexander Sakharov. I will be happy to connect and I will uh, go for it. Connect. And, vi and visit uh, the university of course, as well, yes. right? So visit always... UCW. Yeah, I'm not always there, but uh, I'm there quite a lot of time during the week and I will be happy to uh, to meet you and give you a tour. Yep. Take his course, people. Take his course, you know, Absolutely. if you can. All right. Well, Alex, thank you for being on the show. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for having me. Hey, do you need an error-free website? Do you need transcription that's accurate and on time? Would you like to remove noise from your video or audio recording? Do you need a spokesperson for your business? If so, we can help. At Northway Capital Group, we are happy to announce that we are now providing website testing services, audio transcriptions, and audio cleanup, as well as spokesperson services. We would love to help you on your next project. Contact us for more information at northwaycapitalgroup at gmail.com. Hey you, do you need a voiceover? Well, look no farther. Northway Capital Group has your answer. Commercials and explainer videos, AVR and voicemail, health and wellness, corporate training and e-learning, announcements, documentaries, and biography. Contact us on social media or email us at northwaycapitalgroup at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to the SME Stories podcast, which is owned by Northway Capital Group. Please follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Northway Capital Group.